Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery again, Tea History Podcast, episode 9 this time. The focus today will be on tea during the Ming Dynasty, blue and white porcelain. That's one of the icons of the Ming, and today we'll look at that too, as well as the town that made it famous. We left off last time in the Song Dynasty and saw how tea progressed since the time of the Tang. We looked at Mo Cha, Tea Powder, Tai Xiang, Hui Zong, E Sai, Mio E, and the new Song Tea culture. And from the day Zhao Kuangyin founded the dynasty, China was surrounded by these tough guys who were always trying to use their brawn and fighting abilities, not to mention surplus horses, to overwhelm the Song. The Kitan Liao first humbled the Song, then the Jurchen Jin knocked out the Kitan, and as an encore, they went on and finished up the northern Song. And then finally, the end came for the Jin in 1234. One, two, three, four. The Mongol forces ran roughshod over the Jurchens, and 37 years later, in 1271, Kublai Khan founded the Yuan Dynasty. And the Yuan Dynasty was not a golden age for tea in China. It was a golden age for laying low and waiting for this tempest to pass. 97 years, the Mongols ruled China. They didn't drink tea the way the Chinese did. They stuck with their strong brick tea, and they liked it mixed with cream or mare's milk and with a little salt thrown in. The way they did it in the Song, with the ground tea powder, the whisk, and the frothy whipped texture, was right out as far as the Mongols were concerned. I'm sure this isn't true in every case, but Dou Cha tea contests more into popular pastime with the Mongol nobles and soldiers. But one change was just starting to happen in the world of Chinese tea during the Southern Song and into the Yuan. This was the introduction of brewing tea from dried, loose tea leaves. A new method of processing tea called Chao Qing had been invented. To chow ching the leaves involved a new kind of drying, which used a pan or a wok to fry the withered leaves of the freshly picked tea. The previous system of roasting and steaming, though it worked, was a little harsh on the leaves and it was easy to burn or scorch them. For green tea, you needed to heat those leaves right away or else they'd start oxidizing like an apple. But this chow ching method halted the enzymatic oxidation in its tracks. Although it was an improvement on past heating methods, this Chao Qing process still needed a couple centuries before it was perfected. This oxidation was good for tea, but bad for things like fruit, shrimp, potatoes, bananas, and avocados. While China's tea culture languished under Mongol rule, the Japanese had no such problem. Despite the two Massive Mongol invasions, rebuffed by the kamikaze winds of 1274 and 1281, the Mongols were unable to do to Japan what they did to China. So while China was under the Mongol yoke, the Japanese thrived and prospered in their national tea culture. The 13th and 14th centuries were not the best times in China for tea, but for Japan, this was the period when the distinctly Japanese tea ceremony was further developed and almost perfected. As I said, the Yuan didn't even last a century. And even when Kublai Khan reigned, he was no Huizong when it came to imperial patronage of tea culture. And without a patron like the emperor, it's hard to keep a thriving national tea culture going. So although it was perhaps a dark age, it's not like it was pitch black. No one in China was given up on tea just yet. One good thing, though, thanks to Mongol and other intrepid traders, as well as the whole Pax Mongolica, among the commodities being traded from west to east was cobalt. In this way, China got a first look at this substance that became the essential ingredient for the blue pigment that would become so famous in the Ming Dynasty. The cobalt came from Iraq and Iran. Though, during the early Ming, cobalt was discovered in China, Zheng He also brought this Persian and Iraqi cobalt back to China in greater amounts during his travels to Hormuz during a few of his seven voyages. The Chinese material 
didn't yield as rich of a blue as the material transported from the Near East. So think of the Yuan Dynasty as a transitional period in the history of tea. When Marco Polo wrote about this time in China, during the period of his service in the employ of Kublai Khan, he hardly mentioned tea, if he mentioned it at all. And if you listen to the venerable China scholar Francis Wood, Kublai Khan never even mentioned Marco Polo. Anyway, the Yuan was the dividing line between the supremacy of compressed tea and the triumph of loose tea leaves. And this brings us to the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644. The Ming was not a dark age for tea. Loose leaf tea is going to become the standard. The whole oxidation process is going to be figured out towards the end of the dynasty and then perfected during the Qing, allowing black tea to be unleashed on the world. The later discovery of black tea is going to do wonders for China's border trade. They had the system down pat as far as making these bricks and tea cakes, but there was still spoilage and mold problems because of the harsh climate. The tea bricks and cakes, still produced from processed green tea, also didn't hold up well in foul weather. But now, with the emergence of black tea and the whole oxidation process understood, this is going to open up a whole new world as far as getting tea shipped over long distances with less spoilage, which meant higher profits. And we know after hearing it a hundred times, at least in these podcasts, the Ming Dynasty was founded by Zhu Yuanzhang, who reigned from 1368 to 1397. And along with Liu Bang, who founded the Han Dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang was one of the two dynasty founders who rose from humble, non-aristocratic beginnings. He's also known as Ming Taizu, as well as the Hongwu Emperor. Lots of good things happened under his Hongwu era. As I mentioned, loose tea became the norm. This happened in 1391, the 16th day of the ninth lunar month of the 24th year of the Hongwu era. That's when the Ming founding emperor said, If you want to send me tribute tea, make sure it doesn't come in brick or tea cake form. In addition to this, new systems for grading tea were established and pretty much the foundations were laid for China's whole domestic and export tea industry for the next few centuries. The whole idea of infusing loose tea leaves in all their glory meant that new kinds of teapots became necessary and began to emerge onto the scene. The early ones were relatively small, since tea was always prepared in small amounts and drunk from small cups. The Chinese figured out at once it wasn't good to leave the hot water in a pot of tea and steep those leaves for too long. While everyone is enjoying their tea, too large a teapot meant the extra water would be sitting there just sucking up all the astringent tannins released from the steeping tea leaves. Anyone who left that Lipton tea bag in there too long knows what I'm talking about. With these new style teapots, all one had to do now was keep adding hot water to the loose tea leaves inside. The purple zisha clay teaware began in the Song, but really became all the rage in the Ming. We'll talk about that. As far as teaware went, nothing was bigger than the story of Jing De Zhen. In fact, why don't we start right here with the history of this historic place. I have to guess that if any of you don't have any Jing De Zhen porcelain in your home, you at least drank out of their teacups or ate off of their plates before at a Chinese restaurant or have seen them at someone's house. There are two stories about how we got the English name China. One of them I've told in a previous China History podcast episode that the word China came from that Qin dynasty. Qin, China. But there's another story, and it concerns the ancient town of Jing De Zhen. Their history dates back to the Han, though the inhabitants of that area have been working with clay since 6500 BCE. The city was first called Xinping, then later became known as Changnan. Changnan Zhen. Zhen means town. In China, you either live in a shi, a Zhen, or a Cun, a city, a town, or a village. So Jing De Zhen is Jing De Town. 
Changnan Jun is Changnan Town. The story goes that the earliest importers of Chinese porcelain got the word China from Changnan. So established was this part of northernmost Jiangxi province as a maker of porcelain. Their ceramics became known as Chinaware, with a small c, of course. Just a story. Changnan, China. Hey, who knows? Changnan didn't become Jingde Jun till the reign of the northern Song Emperor Junzong. He was the nephew of the founder and was the third emperor of the Song. One of the five era names of Junzong's reign was the Jingde era, lasting from 1004 to 1007. Changnan was already an established go-to place for any and all porcelain wear. So it was there that the Song Junzong Emperor called for imperial officials to be stationed, and their job was to personally oversee all the porcelain production earmarked for palace use. And believe it or not, it stayed that way for 900 years. In the Song and Yuan, imperial agents would sort through the very best that all the different individual kilns had to offer. They'd be presented with the cream of the cream, and these imperial agents would select which pieces went to the capital. In the early Ming, Jushan, or Pearl Hill, today a district of Jingdezhen, a special ceramics operation was set up that produced porcelain ware exclusively for the capital. And this place remained in operation up through the end of the Qing so although Jing De Jun's history as China's porcelain capital goes back as far as the Tang or even the Han, it's in the Ming Dynasty again, 1368 to 1644, where Jing De Jun porcelain first achieves notoriety and global acclaim. And may I further add that in a way, Jing De Jun porcelain was China's first global brand. The treasures that come out of Jing De Jun were prized in their own time by emperors and other royals. Even today, collectors fork over ridiculous sums of money for Jing De Jun porcelain. Some of you may recall earlier in 2014, some Shanghainese pharmaceutical magnate named uh, Liu Yiqian paid $36 million U.S. to purchase a tiny porcelain cup, 3.1 inches in diameter. This chicken cup, as it was called because of the painted hen and rooster images, was produced about a hundred years into the Ming Dynasty for the Changhua Emperor, who reigned 1464 to 1487. Jing De Jun isn't just famous for being the exclusive purveyor of porcelain ware to the imperial family. Towards the latter half of the Ming Dynasty, that's when the Europeans came calling for the first time. And the second they laid their eyes on this stuff, it's going to be a case of love at first sight. And Jing De Jun is going to become the primary exporter to the world of one of China's signature product specialties. Japanese buyers bought from Jing De Jun and even brought their own designs there to be produced for their market. Even after the Hongwu Emperor died in 1398, there were still 305 years to go before Bertiger figured out the secrets of the 72 steps to turn kaolin mixed with ground china stone into a crystallized, hard porcelain object. So Jing De Jun is going to have one hell of a run between the Ming and the year 1703 in the Qing Dynasty. The reason the center of the porcelain world ended up in Jing De Jun was because of the rich deposits of kaolin and rich clay that because of the low iron content, was particularly white. In Mandarin, this clay is called Gaoling. There's a Gaoling mountain there. And guess what mineral deposit it's loaded with? Then not far away were the Sanbao Mountains, which were chock full of feldspar and rich china stone, the other main component in making porcelain. Today, Kaolin's largest application is in the paper industry, where it's used as a clay coating for paperboard. But kaolin, this stuff was the best for making porcelain. Because of the inherent nature of this substance, kaolin, you could make a cup or dish or whatever, eggshell thin, translucent, just 
gorgeous. It was a pleasure to hold and to behold. Porcelain produced out of Jingda Jun was expensive, but the mass market export quality China where they also produced was affordable at the same time. And this is going to be a key point because once tea gets enthusiastically embraced by the unwashed masses of Europe and America, everyone had to have one of these China teapots. And not only that, once Zhu Yuanzhang, the Hongwu Emperor, put his foot down and declared that henceforth tea should come packed loose and no longer compressed, these teapots, gaiwans, and teacups became perfect vessels to enjoy this new loose tea culture. Though first begun in the Yuan Dynasty, hua cha, or scented tea, began to gain in popularity in the Ming as new ways to make these flower-scented teas are figured out. Fujian province, as usual, taking the lead. Loose tea opened up the door to all kinds of new processed teas like scented tea and tea blends that mix different spices, fruits, or other additives. I read that another use of scented teas well, it was sometimes to disguise the aroma of otherwise inferior teas. If the leaves weren't quite up to par or past their sell-by date, well, you could disguise the tea's shortcomings with a hint of jasmine, rose, or osmanthus. This was an old trick some Cantonese chefs picked up when they invented sweet and sour pork. The pungent, viscous, red-orange sauce would drown out any slight odors coming from three-day-old pork. Eh, the Guaylos had no idea. Other places produced ceramics, but only... Jing De Jun's designs became internationally renowned. Back in the Ming Dynasty, as far as China was concerned, the known world consisted of Asia, India, Egypt, Europe, and East Africa. If Jing De Jun is China's most famous city for porcelain, Jing De Jun's most famous porcelain, especially wherever tea was concerned, was their blue and white. Production began around 1340, at the tail end of the Yuan Dynasty during their last emperor, Huizong. Different Huizong from the stylish Northern Song Emperor we featured in four parts and discussed last episode in part eight. So this porcelain ware, in no time at all, in the years just before the Great Age of Discovery, became China's most well-known export. It was a huge hit in every market it appeared. Zheng He, on his seven voyages, spread a lot of this stuff around, all over the place. People are still digging shards of these blue and white teapots and teaware out of the ground all the way into our day at all the places he visited, including the former Swahili coast in East Africa. A lot of Straits Chinese families have some of these antique blue and white pieces that came from the Zheng He era. The custom was continued during the Ming that dictated when the emperor died, his porcelain ware was never used again. I don't know if it was buried with him in his tomb or what they did with it, but whenever there was a new emperor on the throne, the kilns of Jing De Jun would suddenly get very busy. For all imperial ware, the custom was always to print on the bottom of the cup, dish, bowl, vase, or whatever, the era name of the emperor. So, for example, during the reign of the Yongle emperor, all the porcelain would be inscribed at the bottom with Da Ming Yongle Zhi, made in the Ming Yongle era. When you look at antiques, you could check the bottom to see if it has these inscriptions. Most of the time, it'll probably just say Zhongguo Zhi Zhao, made in China. Nowadays, the workshops in Jing De Jun are mostly all modernized, fully automatic, computerized, and state-of-the-art. Tens of thousands of people clocked in every day at the kilns of Jing De Jun during the Ming. The growth of the operation there grew spectacularly during the Ming period, and even more during the Qing. And though the workshops produced all manners of categories of porcelain products, it was tea that was the driving force behind a great deal of this growth. Every age had their definitive tea manuals. The Tang had Lu Yu's classic of tea, the Cha Jing. In the Song, you had Huizong's tea treatise and the Cha Lu of Tsai Xiang. In the Ming, 
There was Zhu Quan's Cha Pu of 1440 and Gu Yuan Qing's Cha Pu of 1541. Same Chinese name, but different English names. Eh, one of those things. Zhu Quan had the good fortune to be the 17th son of the Ming Dynasty founding emperor. He got to live a very fun and productive life. He was a master of the arts, music, and Taoism. He was also a military man, but had been muscled out of any possible political role by his older brother, Zhu Di, the later Yongle Emperor. So Zhu Quan, knowing a losing battle when he saw one, stayed clear of politics and lived the life of a gentleman scholar. And with all this time on his hands, he freshened up all the work of his predecessors and brought tea culture one step closer to perfection with his work describing the latest in tea preparation, utensils, and further tips on water. But most of all, this tea manual, written by Zhu Quan, was the first of the tea classics that was written during the time of loose tea leaves. He was in lockstep with his father, the Hongwu Emperor, on this matter. Brewing loose tea was a radical departure from the established ways of doing things. Zhu Quan also offered up commentary on past tea classics. After the Hongwu Emperor's decree saying no more tea bricks, it was left up to the son, Zhu Quan, to explain the new culture to an eager audience. Zhu Quan had written in the Cha Pu that the way of preparing tea from tea cakes profoundly impacted the taste of the tea. The only way to get the true, inherent taste of the tea leaves was by brewing the processed loose tea in boiled water. And like Lu Yu, Zhu Quan was a strong advocate for ambience. Where you were drinking the tea and the conditions in which you were drinking was also important and contributed to the overall experience. All these great tea masters had reasons for their favorite kind of teaware. Zhu Quan believed white tea bowls was the way to go if you wanted to truly appreciate the tea. So we can rest assured that had Zhu Quan been alive in the Tang, he would have favored Xingware over Yueware. The cast iron teapots that today no self-respecting tea master would be without, those too were given a big boost by Zhu Quan. Boiling your water in those kinds of pots on your charcoal stove was the way to go back then and still today. These two are available at local tea shops and in most of the online stores. They ain't cheap, but I saw a nice collection of 27-ounce cast iron teapots online going for around 50 bucks. I've also seen these things going for hundreds of dollars. The other Cha Pu was written by Gu Yuan Qing. He lived 1487 to 1565, the time of the Zheng De and Jia Jing emperors. Now I'm just going to mention a couple of these tea classics. By this time in the Ming Dynasty, books were being printed in every direction with every would-be tea expert weighing in about the uh, best ways to prepare, serve, and drink tea. Gu Yuan Qing's tea manual, like Zhu Quan's, focused solely on loose tea. I guess maybe in this new age of tea, new advice needed to be dispensed. Gu Yuan Qing's book mainly talks about the eight requisites for tasting tea. All seems so common sense, but I guess not back in the mid-16th century. A few of the main points from this work, use good quality tea and fresh spring water to make it. Pay attention to how you boil the water and infuse the tea leaves. Don't skip on the utensils. Use the best there is. Then, as far as tasting the tea, you don't he cha or drink tea. You pin cha. To he is to drink. To pin is to sip. Now, I didn't know this when I began my uh, tea studies in Hangzhou in 2013. This character, pin, three mouth characters, sangako, in a pyramid, one on top of the two, I always knew it meant thing, like chan pin or pin zhong, but it also has another meaning, to sip. So Gu Yuan Qing, in his tea manual, made an extra effort to emphasize that you pin your cha. What other words of wisdom from Gu Yuan Qing? Watch the water temperature. If you boil it too long, it releases oxygen and causes the water to taste flat. And choose your tea companions carefully. Nothing enhances the pure enjoyment of the tea experience 
than good and interesting friends to share it with you. Gu's eighth requisite is to put your heart into the preparation of the tea, and don't forget the tea snacks. There are so many of these tea books. Some we remember, some we don't. So much was changing. I know we don't look at the 14th and 15th centuries as recent times, but for China's long history, going back 4,200 years to the legendary Xia in 2194 BCE, the Ming was modern history. Zhu Yuanzhang only founded the Ming dynasty six and a half centuries ago. So you can see in the context of 4,200 years, the changes happening in Ming dynasty tea culture sort of fall under the category of recent Chinese history. I guess the main thing you could say about tea and the Ming dynasty, besides the emergence of loose tea and Jing De Jun onto the world stage, would be that the tea ceremony, the tools of the trade, the utensils used, the processing ways, and the general way we casually and formally drink tea all sort of become recognizable to us in the Ming. The evolution wasn't complete, but... If today's tea masters had to do a gong fu tea ceremony to someone back in the Ming dynasty, they'd probably do okay. I guess once you got rid of the bricks and the need to grind the tea, the ceremony became a much more aesthetically pleasing experience. Well, I don't want to say anything, but we're in stoppage time, so we may as well draw the curtains and call it a night. Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, Cali, beseeching you once again to come back next time for another gratifying episode of the Tea History Podcast.